smart company, James now leads Australia's foremost business column as it heads to its 50th anniversary next year. James has the duty of having that chat with Jacob. Please welcome James Thompson to the Melbourne Mining Club. I'd now like to invite Patrick Smith, the MD and CEO of AMC Consultants, to introduce our guest speaker, Jakob Stalsholm. Jakob Stalsholm joined Rio Tinto in September 2018 as Executive Director and Chief Financial Officer. He became Chief Executive in January 2021. As Chief Executive, Jakob brings strategic and commercial expertise and governance experience. He is committed to rebuilding trust with communities and traditional owners and engaging broadly with, with stakeholders, including governments, partners, and other business leaders. He continues to focus on improving operational performance, including through Rio's safe production system, creating and progressing value accretive growth options, while remaining disciplined on capital allocation and delivering returns for shareholders. Jakob has over 20 years experience, primarily in senior finance roles at Maersk Group and Royal Dutch Shell, he was also a non-executive director of Woodside Petroleum and State Oil, which is now Equinor. Members and guests, please welcome Jakob Stausson to the Melbourne Mining Club. Nice to see you. It's, uh, it's a pretty incredible room, isn't it? I, I believe this is your first time to the Melbourne Mining yeah. Club. Um, I, I wonder how you might reflect as a boy growing up in Denmark that you'd ever end up sitting on a stage like this in a room like this with a giant organ behind you like that. <laughs> it, it is indeed. Uh, thanks, uh, James. Very overwhelming. Um, Denmark is far away. I, I guess if you dig a hole from Denmark, you end up somewhere between Melbourne and, and New Zealand. But you know, the difference here is what strikes you is that you actually really understand the need for mining in this country. In Denmark, I mean, Denmark has only existed since uh, the last ice age. There is no geology, there is no opportunities for mining, and people often forget that you can't produce all the consumer goods that you are consuming without having mining. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we heard a little bit about your resume there. Uh, you spent some time in shipping and of course at Shell in, in the energy sector. Are there things from both of those two industries that have helped you as you've uh, come into the mining sector? Are, are there some similarities or, or perhaps there's the differences that have been more instructive? Yeah, I think uh, all, th all three industries are long-term capital-intensive businesses. Maersk is long-term, oil and gas is longer-term, and mining is really long-term. Uh, mining has got cyclicality, but I can tell you, it's nothing compared to shipping. <laughs> That's real cyclicality. So I learned a few lessons uh, from, uh, from both Maersk and Shell. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I might jump forward if we can, uh, it, it cast your mind back to mid-2020, uh, I think you've been at Rio for about two years in a finance, in, as a Chief Financial Officer, um, having replaced the great Chris Lynch who's here today. Um, the company was in a, a, a fairly, a, a very difficult position, let's not beat around the bush. Uh, um, that you'd just gone through the Jukan Gorge crisis, uh, you'd just lost your CEO, um, what on earth possessed you to put your hand up to take on the top role when the place is in crisis? 
Did, did you... Did you get to Rio thinking, oh, one day I wouldn't mind being CEO, or was this a sort of moment that you felt, this is my time to step forward? Look, uh, I probably didn't thought too much about that when I joined Rio. I thought it was an amazing company. And the first two years before COVID, I basically traveled around and tried to learn the mining industry and, and Rio Tinto. And by the way, my boss was younger than me, so the likelihood that I would take over from him was probably not that high. But, but I think one has to go back to 2020. It was a terrible period of time. Mm -hmm. We were all locked into houses. I was sitting in a small little summer house in Denmark. And you guys were writing everything, the most negative stories about Rio Tinto. We were full of shame of what had happened with Duke and Gorge. And I felt I had joined this amazing company with great people. And somehow, when the board decided to take out a number of executives, including the CEO, I could read in the newspapers that we should just get some new people in from the outside and everything would be good. And I was absolutely convinced that that was not the solution. The solution was inside the company. Mm. And that was what got me to, to raise my hand and saying, actually, I can see we can create a great team and we can take the company forward again, acknowledging where we were. And that was a low point. Did you have any realistic expectation they'd pick you? Um, well, I have to say, if I read in the newspapers, I should have very low expectations. <laughs> but y yes, sometimes I you shouldn't read in the newspapers too much, you know. But, yeah. but I had 10 interviews. And ten. 10? 10, 10 interviews. And, and I warmed up quite a lot. And as I went along, I actually started believing in myself. <laughs> and uh, I was quite convinced because I, I realized that even if there were external candidates that was better than me, they would have no chance to make the diagnostics and the plan that I had derived. And I have spent time, I remember in, immediately before I raised my hand, I spent three days or a weekend and a day just deriving my, my diagnostics and, and finding out what the plan should be. And I also very quickly realized it was all about getting the culture right in view and we would strive. Yeah. So, you, you, and I should confess, I think uh, this columnist might have been someone who suggested who's this guy that they've just appointed, but um, uh, may, maybe I was wrong, time, time will tell you. What, what, what were sort of the key parts of that plan? I mean, you, yes, you, you're sort of a relatively out, you, you're a bit of an outsider to the mining industry, but you're also an insider in that I guess you might say you were CFO, mm. arguably part of the problem. Uh, you know, did, did Rio focus too much on financial returns? Did it lose sight of mm. sort of what made it great? Or, or, or tell us a little bit about this sort of cultural issue that you diagnosed. But look, um, there was very good reasons why there was focus on the financials. If you go back um, from the beginning of, of, of this century, I would argue Rio Tinto was the most successful mining company on the planet. And then we went into some deal making that turned out not to be good timing. And uh, it was a great company. We bought Alcan, but it was fairly expensive. It was, we entirely debt financed it and we went into the financial crisis. Suddenly we realized that our competitor BSP uh, made an offer to buy us out. So we probably lost quite a lot of self-confidence there. Okay. And we certainly ended up with a balance sheet full of debt and, uh, and, and, and Chris Lynch here, he, he really put back uh, financial discipline and, and got the debt back. But, but there's more to it, of course, than financial disciplines. Uh, I learned that as I came in as CFO and we probably somewhat lost our way uh, after the rather traumatic experiences uh, earlier in, uh, in, 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 in the century. So uh, it takes a long time. To, to, to change culture. Yeah. One of the things you did uh, when you became CEO was, I know every CEO goes on the listening tour and it's sort of standard fare, but one of the things you did was to go back and talk to some of the, uh, the wise old heads around Rio, um, former executives, former CEOs, mm. some of whom are in the room actually today, and I know there's a Rio alumni event on today. What, what were you hoping to learn when you reached out to those people? <clears throat> Look, um, often people are, journalists would ask, so who are the business leaders that you admire the most? And people say, 
is it uh, Satya Nadella or is it Elon Musk or something like that? I don't need to look outside. We we have we have giants of, of leaders from the past, and uh, um, I learned quite a lot uh, uh, from from my former chairman of Woodside Petroleum, Charles Good, who is also here today, and he introduced me to. We actually have four former CEOs from Rio Tinto CIA who is living in Melbourne today, mm. uh, Rod Carnegie, uh, John Ralph, Leon Davis, and, and Lee Clifford, two of them are here to, today. And, and just having the opportunity to bounce off and talk about things and hear what kind of questions they would ask me, I actually learned an awful lot from. And uh, of course the world is different today. Of course, for example, climate change is a different challenge than 25 years ago, but a lot is the same. Yeah. And uh, if you look carefully about what I came out with within my first month, I talked about four priorities for the company, about being best operator, about having impeccable ESG credentials, about excellent development, acknowledging the long-term nature of our company, and about having a strong social license. A lot of it, you can find that excellence uh, from uh, what former CEOs have practiced. Did they have some... Uh tough words for you too, some, some criticisms of where Rio's been? I don't felt so. Many others did. I mean, <laughs> I gotta be honest with you. Immediately after I took over, I realized the best thing would probably be to face the crisis. So I went to Australia, get, went through the hotel quarantine and stayed four months here. Uh, and I met many people who were very critical. But I will say to you one thing. I still haven't met a single person here in Australia who wouldn't like to see Rio Tinto succeed, even if they were angry. And that was, that was quite helpful. Yeah. That gave me confidence that it would be possible. So you, you had those four priorities which were set pretty early. Uh, what was it like getting your teams internally to sort of pick themselves uh, uh, up off the floor. I imagine, you know, being a member of the Rio Tinto team might not have been all that pleasant in 2020. Uh, did they require a bit of, you know, was that a big part of it, getting the internal messaging right? Look, there's no doubt we, all of us individually and collectively had to look ourselves in the mirror and there was elements of, of guilt around us. But nonetheless, there was a desire to, to get things right. And, uh, and it was a team journey. I was very deliberate. I remember you interviewed me and I, was, I, I had a strategy of not saying too much to the press in the beginning because I realized that working with a team, it would probably be somewhat more wise that it was, was just derived from myself. So I took my time before we kind of laid out a wider strategy for Rio Tinto and we really worked that as a team and it's a good way of getting a team going. Yeah. One of the things I think, uh, you might, perhaps you heard this criticism from others, but one of the things I think under previous administrations is that Rio lost a bit of its connection with Australia. Mm. Um, it, it, it is a bit of a weird beast in that it's dual listed. Uh, the headquarters are sort of in London and sort of in Melbourne. Um, a lot of the operations are here. And it sees itself as a, as a global company quite rightly. But did that, that connection with Australia fray a little bit? It did, but I don't think it was specific on Australia. I think we as a company in our desire to become more efficient were becoming a little bit too inward looking and perhaps forgot a little bit on if you want to be, and that's what we are trying to capture in the four objectives, if you want to be successful long term in mining, you have to work inside the gate mm. and outside the gate and we needed to put more focus on outside the gate. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about those, uh, in those four priorities, what have been some of the key things about rediscovering Rio's groove? Yeah, look, um, if you take the first objective of, of, of uh, best operator, uh, Rio have had the best uh, iron ore uh, business for, for decades, and it really started under, under John Alf's uh, uh, reign. Of, of, of really getting it right, getting the, the, the lean manufacturing thinking in and, 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 and really become best operator. And we, we lost a bit of that and, uh, and that's what we are reinstating with the safe production system. Uh, this is, 
we could find a lot from the past. It's, it's fascinating in a year like this year where we are turning 150 uh, and we're writing a book right now, it would be out before Christmas. I have had the opportunity to read some of the chapters and there's so much to learn. If you lose your history, you kind of impair your, your future. You have got so much strength from, from the past. Yeah. A few other things that you've had to really address uh, on the ESG front, the Duke and Gorge tragedy, obviously still, uh, you know, hangs over the company in a way. How do you feel the process of um, repairing relations with uh, First Nations people is, is going? Look, I'm always very careful of making such an assessment because ultimately it's the traditional owners who should make that assessment. But, but I'm actually very proud of to see how the organization have felt. This is felt that we really must do better here and that people are prepared to really weigh in and realize we got to learn here, we got we to gotta be humble and, and find a way. And, and, and I think we have come a long way, but asking for having re-established trust, that's, that's not me, you can ask that question. It, it has, uh, I improving the relations means slowing down some of the, uh, the, the operations, it seems, or the planning, mine planning. I, I, is that a... Is that something that Rio should have been done, doing before, going a little bit slower and, and a bit, being a bit more considered? Or is that something that will change over time as you rebuild the relationship? The, the trust will mean you can move a bit quicker. Look, um, PKKP, the traditional owners of the land of, of Duke and Gorge, uh, have been really instrumental for us and they really invented the concept of co-management of, of, of the land and if you think about it, if you build the right relationships and you really co-develop things, that's how you create sustainability. And if you take the Pilbara, there's ample of iron ore, so uh, you can actually very well do uh, uh, co-develop uh, solutions. And we already have that. Uh, this year we've started construction, the, the Western Range project, which is co-developed with the Inawonga people. So it is, uh, it is happening, but you're right. Mine planning today it has changed quite a lot in discipline from what it was in the past. And that's a good thing? I think so. Yeah, fair enough. Um, another big moment, I guess, for Rio was the release of the um, report into safety at work, and in particularly sexual harassment and bullying. Um, was it a very deliberate decision to publish that report and make it... Uh, Put, put all your cards on the table, I guess, or, or all your sins on the table, that perhaps the old Rio would have kept that report under wraps, released a sort of summary of it or something, but you, you, you went with the, the sort of full transparency. Yeah, look, it wasn't that thought through. Uh, it all started by uh, realising, uh, in fact, uh, the, the day Simon Trott arrived in Perth, there was a front page on the West Australian newspaper of... Uh, of, of uh, uh, pretty terrible um, uh, rape case, if not from our mind, mm. but obviously in our executive team we discussed whether this could happen in our mind and uh, I think the answers were not very convincing, so we realized we need to dig deeper into the issues here and we hired Liz Broderick and she was very methodical and that's very helpful because what you don't need is hearsay, you need real research, you need real data. When she came out with a report, no matter how disturbing it was, it was really a gift for us because it was factual, nobody dis disputed it. So we wanted to have a dialogue with our 50,000 staff. But just tell me, how am I going to have a dialogue with 50,000 staff without announcing it? So we hadn't thought it through, but when we s were sitting with the report, we suddenly realized we cannot have the open dialogue without putting it out. I was sitting here in Melbourne, I remember, together with Kelly Parker, and I didn't like it at all. But but it was the right, it was the only thing we could in order to move on internally. And somehow we went through the day. Do, do you feel, how, how do you sort of, how do you measure how the culture has changed in response to that? I mean, do, do you think it's been positive and? So there's 26 recommendations, but it's more hygiene factors, things we need to have in place. I think the key thing is, it's, it's a bit like a safety journey. First, you have to recognize from a value perspective that these things are important. Secondly, you need a dialogue. And we were not talking about these issues. But with the report, it was kind of the license to start having the discussions in the offices, on the sites. 
And now, every time I go to site, people are just talking about it. And they are very, very pleased. They, many are coming and thanking me and saying, "Why? thanks for, 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 for publishing this report, etc." Because the point is, of course, I can't change the culture. But we can decide to change. People at a site can decide to change the culture. Sometimes it's the second home. What kind of tone do you want here? And, and it, is, it is changing. I'm absolutely convinced that. You can also see some evidence of it in terms of higher engagement scores in our surveys, etc. How would you describe the tone in Rio at the moment? <sighs> Look, we are not at all perfect, uh, but, but we, are, we, are, we are improving. And I do think our new values around care, courage, and curiosity is something that we are actually really trying to live. You can always put values up on the wall, but I think we're actually trying to, to live it. Um, uh, some other markers of, of change, I, I guess, are operational and uh, financial. We had your results um, for the half year last week. And of course, uh, Jakob told the uh, journalists not to look at the comparisons between the first half 2023 and first half 2022. Oh, James, you pulled the legs on me. So I had an interview with James and I thought I would just give a service information so he could write a good article. But of course, he took it all on the block and just wrote, Jakob doesn't want to be compared with the beginning of last year, but the second part of the last year. Oh, well, thank you. I did make the point that, that, um, that, that you're, you, have, you are seeing a bit of progress. You, I think production growth in copper, copper equivalent was up about 5%. Yeah half to half, uh, and that's the sort of momentum that I imagine internally makes everyone go, we're starting to get the mojo back? Look, we have had a period where we have got financial discipline in place, we have reduced the debt, we have a very profitable business, first half, 20% return on capital employed, it's probably been closer to 30% over the last three years, mm. so if you can make profitable growth, you create value to the shareholders. And and you start seeing it now. You see the iron ore business five quarters in a row with production growth. We are, we are uh, coming out stronger. I should ask about iron ore. We saw some China tweaking the stimulus dials again yesterday in a sort of bit of a scattergun approach. Um, what's your sense of how the, the Chinese economy is traveling? I mean, 5% GDP is what they're targeting. That mm. sounds pretty good on the surface, but it does feel like it's pretty up and down in China. What's the Rio view? Yes, um, correct, but um, allow me, uh, James, uh, you're a journalist. Uh, I do think when we read Western newspapers, we also only get one side of the coin. And uh, many of us, including myself, have spent two weeks in China walking at, 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 at st uh, steel manufacturers, and China has not wasted time during COVID. The productivity improvement, the apl applications of technology is, is massively impressive. They are, they are progressing uh, as an industrial nation. And what I take positively out of the current situation is at least the government, the new government of China acknowledged that there is an issue. And they actually have a track record when they have an issue with the economy that they are very, very good at, at addressing the issue. So. Uh, that's why I use the term, I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah. How much do you worry about where iron ore prices are going over one quarter or one half? Do, Not a lot. Do, you don't think about it much? No, because, look, what matters is what is going to be the average over the next 10 years. And sometimes a little bit of volatility is not a bad thing. I mean, last year, we saw a little dip below 80 just for a couple of weeks, and you immediately see that somebody starts curtailing the production. So the cost curve works. Mm. So to, to, to think about your 10-year view, the 10-year average price, how, how do you see the iron ore steel market developing? I mean, is generally, are, are we close to the peak and, and this oh, yeah. is a gentle fall away or is there still room for growth? Globally, I think China has reached the saturation point in terms of its uh, steel production, but it's at a, at a very high level. And, um, and then you could probably see growth elsewhere. Mm. So it's, it's a kind of a fairly stable market, which have always been our projections. It's a massive market. It's a, it's a good, very good business. You mentioned earlier uh, a couple of the moments when Rio might have lost its way in the last two decades or so revolved around big deals. Um, 
has that scared Rio off big M&A forever? Uh, no, no, definitely not forever, but, but it's, it's a fact that when we bought a, a Elysium project in Argentina a, a year and a half ago, it was our first acquisition in 10 years. Mm. And that's not necessarily a good thing. You, I, I, I don't think we need a big acquisition right now, partly because it tends to disturb your focus and we are on a rather transformative journey, so I, I don't want that. But what we are trying to do is a bit of a smaller uh, portfolio uh, acquisitions that actually shapes the portfolio in a, in, a, in, a, in a helpful way. It was a simplification last year to take out the minority shareholders of Oriol Tolkoy. Uh, as late as a week ago, you've seen that, in my view, we are trying to future-proof our enormous aluminium business. We have the Western world's largest aluminium business, but we were not really in recycling, and with a new joint venture, we, we're really going to get scale there. Yeah. And you did a deal overnight, which uh, some people might have heard of in Chile. Absolutely. Yeah. Tell with, us a little bit about that. With Codelco, and it's, it's at the exploration phase, but it's, it's very interesting copper deposit, and it's interesting to work closely together with a, with a great company like Codelco as well. Are there more of these small-scale little bolt-ons that, that, that are possible? Is, is there a sort of pipeline of those deals? That are oh, absolutely. But we do, we, I mean... We do a lot under the radar on explorations, which are so small that you don't see it, but, but they, are, they are definitely uh, opportunities. And some of the, see, you want to try to be a little bit counter-cyclical. And the reality is there's a lot of hype around lithium and, and copper right now. So it's very difficult to go in and buy a, a lithium company, a copper company, because you buy it and then you work for 10 years to justify what you are paid for it and you haven't really created any value. But with technology and, they, and very often exploration expertise, there might be easier ways to get in. Mm. Uh, the the, the Rincon um, project has sort of hit a little, little spot of trouble in that yeah. um, the, the cost has blown out from, uh, I think it's 140 to 330 uh, million dollars. Now, uh, as you said to us last week, this glass half full, glass half empty there. It's, it's good that it's not a huge project, so the cost blowout's definitely manageable, and it's good that you've learnt the lessons here. But does this, what, what does this say about the difficulties in getting critical minerals projects up? That the cost, the social licence, you've had your own issues in Serbia with a lithium project? Is yeah, it getting too hard? No, I think, that, I think there are a couple of things. I think inflation is getting better in general for our operations, but I do see just over the last month, a number of mining companies have come with cost and schedule blowouts on projects. Mm. So I worry a bit about projects. And, um, and then it's definitely difficult to get permission. Uh, uh, yes, we are struggling a bit on an amazing project in Serbia for lithium, but we're also trying to get permission to what could be an enormous copper project in Arizona resolution and where we have been through a 10-year uh, uh, consultation uh, process. So it is, uh, it is difficult to meet the needs of the world if you can't get any permission. The US have not uh, permitted a new hard rock mine since they permitted to us Eagle in 2008. But, but 10 years, Jakob, I mean, that, that's, that, that's crazy when you think about the energy transition and, and yeah. what we need for that, copper and lithium. I mean, does there need to be a point where uh, the necessity of minerals for that transition sort of overrides some of those concerns we have about um, allowing new mining? Mathematically, yes. But the fact is, of course, that the world adjusting and addressing climate change is going much slower than any projections. I mean, everybody signs up to the Paris Agreement, but we are not following it through. And it's, we, we are falling behind. And if you look at things like development of renewable energy, I mean, it's basically only China who is really developing renewable energy at scale right now. Mm. Do you have uh, any concerns about the sort of cost of the, the decarbonisation process? You, you had a write down in your um, aluminium business, alumina business last, yeah. last week. I, is that just part of the process that the world has mm. to go through? Look, um, we set some very ambitious targets two years ago on reducing our carbon emission by 50% by 2030 and 100% uh, by 2050. 
So that was a kind of a 28 years journey. We are now two years down, 26 to go. And I think there's an awful lot happening. You just in this half year result, we have just got the first mine in the world to be 100% on biodiesel at our boron site in California. We have just implemented a new, well, it's a test plant, but it works, of a blue smelting where we can reduce, in ilminite smelting, we can reduce the CO2 emission by 95%. And mind you, we are both a mining and a processing uh, company, and 80% of our scope one and two emissions are actually in the processing. So the key thing is to solve the emissions in processing, and we are making huge technological uh, breakthroughs. Well, we're going to hand back to Rebecca for questions from the room in a, in a couple of minutes, Jakob. I wonder if you might reflect on your own sort of role at Rio. I, I, I sort of, I, I guess at the start you might have been a bit of a firefighter CEO <laughs> and, and there was plenty of fires to, to put out. They're mainly out now, the, the, the place looks from the outside at least and, and from what you've said today, it feels like it's in much better shape. How do you think about your own time as CEO? I mean, I, I don't want to mention this, but the last three CEOs sort of departed in, um, in, in less than, uh, uh, didn't get to choose the time of their departure, perhaps is the way we should say it. Do you, how do you think about your, where your um, uh, time as CEO goes from here? I must admit, uh, I've not spent two seconds thinking about retirement. I really enjoy it. Uh, but Rio Tenso is a big company. It's not about me as an individual. And when I was interviewed to the job, uh, I said, succession planning starts day one. You never know whether something happens to me, etc. And one of the characteristics of a, what I would call a blue chip company is exactly that you've got a lot of capable leaders. I'm not a CEO, the one who should select my, my successor, but my job is to try to develop as many leaders as far as they can go. And leadership development has been at the heart of, of certainly what I believe in, probably because I had to start looking at myself first and how could I get the best out of myself. But the same, I mean, I'm trying to give a lot of space to my members in the executive team, but if there's one thing I'm relentless about, is about that people must work on their own development. And we, we, we are here to keep on improving. There's nothing more dangerous. If you lack, stop that curiosity. You're not, you're not even standing still, you're going backwards. We have now had 400 leaders through quite intense leadership development, which is, Really, on a very simple thing is, how can you lead others if you can't lead yourself? How can you lead yourself if you don't know yourself? You, you, you have to just, it's a responsibility for other people that you must do everything you can to be the best of yourself. Jakob, thank you for putting up with my questions and we'll uh, take some more curly ones from the room. Thanks, James, and thanks, Jakob. It's now time to continue the conversation from the floor. So if you've got a question, please raise your hand. We've got some roving mics. And I'd ask, could you stand and uh, state your name and where you're from and ask away? First question down in the middle. Thanks, Rebecca. Julia Crasty from Orica, sitting at the OzIMM table. OzIMM is 130 years plus, and Orica is about to turn 150 years, like Rio, Jakob. Rio is, of course, a very good client of Orica's, and we're fortunate enough to partner with Mel Cooper on diversity, equity, and inclusion. James was very quick to point out a lot of Orica's, uh, sorry, Rio's challenges, but I'm interested, on reflection, 150 years, what would be your key strength, thinking about the human-centric rather than production or operations? Yeah, th <laughs> thank you. That's, that's a tall order to just extract one, uh, one key strength, but I think that, Ability, uh, I would call it adaptability. Uh, it's not kind of a strength, but, but it's being successful in mining is a quite holistic discipline. You actually have to get many disciplines right. And I think the history book is showing that ability to adjust. I mean, I just get fascinated when I start with the, the Spanish mine. Uh, the, 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 the king lost the throne in, in Spain and a new republic appeared. It was basically bankrupt, so it wanted to sell the mines. Investors in London established the Rio Tinto company. People said, this is mad. It's a depleted mine. It's been de 
mine for 5,000 years in an unstable country. But they built a mine, they built a port, they built a railway, and within 10 years it was the world's largest and, and very profitable copper mine. And, and you can see that regeneration. At some stage, we had to get out of the mines in, 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 in Spain, and we went to Africa, and then suddenly we were on all continents. So that ability to adjust and accept that, uh, that the world is changing is, is, is probably a cause, the core strength I would point out. Thank you. Um, Richard. Hi, my name is Isabel. I'm a student. Well, was a student. I just graduated <laughs> from Melbourne Uni um, with geology. Um, my question is a little bit different. Um, so in Australia, students are not engaging in geosciences at a tertiary level. Um, and we know that this is crucial that we have graduates that are entering the mining industry, um, particularly as we support an energy transition. Um, you mentioned curiosity as being one of Rio Tinto's core values. Um, so what can you say that Rio Tinto is doing to support curious and passionate students currently in geoscience education? So, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, it actually gives me an opportunity that we made an announcement this morning as part of our 150 years uh, birthday. We have decided, uh, with the help of, of Imperial College in London, to um, donate $150 million for, uh, for uh, research to solve a lot of, a lot of big challenges uh, within mining, climate change, etc. So we are making big donations to, uh, uh, to research and education institutions around the world. Uh, so uh, a very timely question. Uh, but I will say to you, if people are looking for a place where you can make a real difference, mm -hmm. a difference for the planet, a difference for the climate, we have ample of opportunities and, uh, and you can make a big difference in, 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 in Rio Tinto. So if, if when you ask the question, where can you make the most? It's absolutely about joining Rio Tinto. Thank you. <laughs> um, down here in the middle. It's good to have the first three questions by women. Uh, my name's Georgina Carnegie, and I will tell my brother, who was one of your four predecessors, uh, how warmly you spoke about issues related to Australia. The first question, the light relief, is I hope you're going to barrack for Australia when we play Denmark uh, <laughs> <laughs> next week. The second one is more serious. Uh, we've been working with the Tungurung people um, to develop a children's book in dual languages. And Auntie Lorraine is here uh, sitting with us, as is the mayor of our local council, and we share your views about community development. But we would really like you to replicate in Victoria what you were doing with your program for children uh, in, in Victoria, where you've had headquarters since 1905. Uh, dual language uh, for primary schools, and we have some dual language books here. Uh, are very valuable ways at the grassroots for primary school children to learn. I think there are about uh, 20 different tribes in Victoria, and many of the mining people in this room rep uh, are working in different areas. But it'd be very helpful to have something that was overarching and helped in that process of practical uh, evaluation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Allow me just first of all to, to recognize uh, what Sir Rod Carnegie have done to Rio Tinto. I mean, the CIA that was created under his leadership was just an amazing company and is, is, is a major part of the success we have today in uh, Rio Tinto. Uh, from being the first to, to trade with China as China opened up and the business that has been created on, on, on the back of that from from 1972 onwards is, is unprecedented. Secondly, uh, I don't like to talk too much about football. That was traumatic for us to lose to Australia, I have to admit. But I will say to you, we did win as Denmark. We did win the Tour de France a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> if anyone is following that. And, uh, and, and more seriously on your uh, proposal, could I suggest that myself and 
our CEO for Australia, Kelly Parker, could learn a bit more about that because it, it sounds as a very interesting uh, project. Uh, we would love to learn more about that. Thank you. Peter Arden, I'm a long-standing research analyst and I was really pleased to hear the words expiration in your uh, discussion and you also talked about cyclicity in mining. Um, as I say, as an analyst who's covered your company over many years in the past, one of the things that used to be disappointing was the stopping of exploration. Sometimes the company just completely stopped, got rid of all the exploration. So it's really encouraging and I just guess I'm interested to hear you reaffirm that exploration really is going to be a part of your future. Yeah. No, no, thank you. Uh, I think fundamentally Rio Tinto is a technology company. Exploration is an important part of it, but we need to get back to, I mean, right now, for example, solving things uh, like climate change. One of the first things I did was re-establish what we had 10 years ago, a chief scientist office, where we really bring a lot of technological innovation. I learned a few lessons from my time in Shell, and I've learned that the worst thing you can do with an exploration budget is to go up and down because you don't gain a lot when you increase it, but you lose an awful lot when you decrease it. So you just have to say, this is our exploration budget, year in, year out, and really believe in it, and then build a super good practice. I think we have an, uh, an amazing uh, practice uh, in, uh, in Rio Tinto. I'm very proud of our exploration team. Thank you. Excuse me, Don Carroll, Lowell Resources. I just had a question. Um, decades ago, I worked for, BH, for Rio Tinto in the Pilbara, so um, it's come a long way since then. Just to, I thought, besides talking about all the things that were covered in the, the interview, which is all about the current problems, can you give a view of the future for Rio Tinto and the mining business? I mean, to say, Bingham Canyon's been expanded, you've got copper mines in Mongolia, you've got the iron ore in Western Australia, you have potential for iron ore in Guinea, uh, as you say, you're making the aluminium business more efficient, but just when you sit down as a board and talk about the future, can you share some of that with us today? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm super excited about uh, the future in that regard that, yes, it's a challenge for us to decarbonize our business, but actually to address climate change, you need to build a whole new energy system, and that requires much, much more uh, uh, minerals and metals that we are producing. It's super good for our aluminium business, for our copper business, and for our emerging battery materials business. So I think we, what we said to our investors is we face over the next 12 years probably a market that will grow by three to three and a half percent per year. That's actually quite a lot. And therefore, why shouldn't we reap those, uh, those uh, growth opportunities as long as we can do it profitable? But I will say to you, I feel that the limitations are more inside our company. The more we can live the four objectives and be successful on that, the more we can grab the opportunities that, that are ahead of us uh, right now. Uh, but I must admit, uh, I am, um, you know, short term, you can always get a little economic setback. But longer term, and that's what really matters, I'm, I'm very optimistic about uh, the opportunities in our business. Ladies and gentlemen, I think given our timing, I know we could keep going, but I think we'll take that as our last question today. Um, and I'd like to introduce John Tivy, um, partner from White and Case, one of our sponsors, to deliver a vote of thanks. John. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Jakob, on behalf of Melbourne Mining Club, I'd like to thank you for your participation today. I think the discussion around your decision to take on the CEO role in the face of the Jurgen Gorge, uh, Gorge situation and your journey since then has been really insightful. We commend you for your foresight in accepting that position based on your insight into the quality of Rio as an organisation and its deep culture. Um, we commend you for your recognition of the extraordinary wisdom that can be gained from engaging with the Rio alumni in that process, Rio's approach to its stakeholders, and in particular, First Nations and addressing OH&S issues, 
your, your uh, strategy in respect of critical minerals and carbon reduction. And of course, it's also wonderful to hear that Rio is committed in the exploration phase, space. All of this uh, journey that you've spoken about today has resulted in the continuation of a major mining house with 150 years of corporate history as a global major in the mining sector. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in thanking Jakob for his discussion today. Thanks, Jakob. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. This is uh, scary, but the world needs it. The mining part here. Yeah. challenge getting it on the plane, but I'm sure you'll get it <laughs> Thank you. James, thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Cheers. John. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, James.